Hello, everybody, and welcome to SciBite, where we talk about the mysteries of the universe and the technology that scientists are using to uncover them. My name is Jeremy. And my name is Heather. And today we're going to be studying time. Time itself. And let me tell you, it's about yep. time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I started the first episode line. with a pun. I might as well keep it going, right? There we go. <laughs> keep it rolling. The more time I spend studying time, the more I realize it takes a vast amount of time to study it. Yeah, you and me both. Let me tell you how much I've been folding my brain over this one. Um, yeah. Today's episode is going to be a little less, um, well, a little less hands-on. Than last week, we had a real specific piece of technology to talk about yeah. in the Gravity Probe B. Well, yep. we started talking about so much about space-time and everything that it just got me really excited to talk about the nature and the concept of time itself. Little did you know. Little did I know. To. <laughs> <laughs> no, it... It, to say that this is kind of a confusing topic is uh, a little bit of an understatement because yeah. as as many people might know that, that pay a little bit of attention, you know, armchair physics and that kind of stuff, we don't actually have, at this point in time, an accurate way to define the force of time. Um, now, well, not really. I, I realize that that sounds like kind of a big thing to be overlooking, but... Uh, yeah. If you think about it, we don't have an accurate way to define why we live in three dimensions instead of two either. Yeah. So uh, just go with it, people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, since the beginning of yep. time, people yep. have been talking and musing about time. And I think yep. actually um, most of the great thinkers of the over the ages have been philosophists on this yes. subject. You know, um, you got to say something. I guess. I mean, uh, like people like Immanuel Kant that believes that time and uh, Martin Heidegger to a certain de degree as well, both believe that time just exists in our head. It's only an illusion in your brain. Yeah. And actually, you know, I think I've, I've heard that Buddhists are, use the term time as an illusion pretty, pretty uh, commonly. Yeah. But you know, when we're talking about science, I think it's more interesting yes. to hear what some of the sci-fi sci authors have also said it about it oh, over yeah. the years. Like, uh, well, you know, the time machine, right? Yeah. I mean, HG Wells and he, uh, actually said what I basically said in, in much yeah. more elucidated, much more clearly here. <laughs> that there's no difference. This is my H.T. Wells impression. There is no difference between time and any of the three dimensions of space except that our consciousness moves along it. I, I really hope that he spoke like that in real life. Yeah. He really should. Very nice, H.T. Wells. <laughs> now, what about, like, now, I, I, I stated earlier that we, uh, we, that science does not currently have a way to measure the force of time, like the actual thing that makes time happen. But yeah. over, the, over the millennium of human existence, everybody's had way, different ways of measuring it. Yeah. You know, people need to know when to plant their crops, when to take them in. Oh, sure, of you course. Know, if nothing else, you want to know what time of the year it is. You know, the Mayans, you know, and even the Egyptians, you know, they, you, you, know you see all these these programs that it's you know the pyramids are built you know pointing in certain directions through the stars the mayans had a whole bunch of stuff that they set up against the stars and it was all you know in part to measure the passage of time mm -hmm. you know the mayans calculated the earth's orbit a lunar month mercury's orbit venus's orbit mars's orbit all to within less than one percent accuracy wow that's that's some pretty good ancient math right there. Now, uh, yeah. tell me a little bit about this. You you put it in our show notes, and I've never uh -huh. heard of it before. You wrote this in here that uh, uh, I'm going to get this pronunciation wrong. <laughs> the Antikythera mechanism. Yes. Tell me a little bit about this magic box. Uh, it was discovered uh, back 1900 or so, and it's estimated to be from about 100 to 150 BC. And it's Whoa. this. It was you know this encrusted mechanism that they just kind of put to the side for a little while, not really figuring out what it is. And through x-ray technology and through various imaging, they're able to see there's gears, very precise gears. You know, it was, they set it up so that they could tell what time of the year it was. They could tell all these different things. There was even uh, a, re a gear that they discovered here in the last two years or so that measured um, like every two years and every four years. So it was like an indicator of the, like the Olympic Games. Telling oh. them, is this a year to hold... As one of the gears within that magic box? Yes, as one of the gears within that magic box. It could spit out, hey, two years have passed. Hey, four years have passed. It's time for... And still nobody knows exactly where it came from or who built no. it. No, I have no idea who built it, where it came from. You know, they're still piecing together because only part of it was found. Mm. So, and it was all to measure time. Mm-hmm. 
And pretty accurately, it sounds like. And also, yeah. y y your notes here say that similar technological devices didn't come along again until like the 14th century. Yeah. That just astounds me that somebody could have come up with this over a thousand years prior to that. Yeah. It's and one of those things where somebody comes up with something and it's, it just doesn't come back until somebody else can come up with it again. Now, you, uh, you touched on the Mayans earlier. This is something uh -huh. that has always interested me. And, you know, it comes up in, the, in modern culture a lot because, you know, 2012 is right around the oh. corner. And apparently yeah. they measured the end of the universe, yeah. whatever. There's not enough science. That is not close enough for science. No, not um, enough close enough for science. But on the subject of them, you know, they did get very close oh. to the actual measurement of a day. Um, however, there's been yes. another recent um, experiment, you might call it, where mm -hmm. the actual measurement of a day is not a fixed constant. Yes. Um, this was done by a group that was using two different radio telescopes. And as they, I wish I had a picture to show you guys, but as they rotate around the planet, uh, they come out of alignment with each other and the, the pulses take different amount of times um, to reach them. Uh -huh. Is this the one that's measuring off a quasar? Yes. So there's a specific quasar that they can look at and they'll point both radio telescopes to it. And as they rotate around the earth, when they line up, then they'll mark that as the starting point, and they need to just mm. wait until it comes back around and they line up, you know, that a day has passed again. And it's kind of like taking apart something and putting it back together like, every day, except it works every day. But mm -hmm. some days there's a couple pieces extra, and some t days there's you're short a couple pieces. Now, have they have determined they exactly why it is that the Earth's um, day varies so much? Because it, it's um, not actually a whole lot. I don't want to no, give anybody a misconception. It's like a matter of millis milliseconds or less. Yeah, it's only a matter of milliseconds. Uh, yeah. There's theories that it could be anything from the winds blowing up against mountains. You know, oh, it's just, like drag. Yeah, just, just just enough that it's you know affecting it this way or that way. So let me let me ask you something else. If we're okay. measuring the the course of a day and uh -huh. it they don't actually work out to be the same length every time around, then yeah. how exactly do things like Atomic clocks, we've been told, are one of the yes. most um, accurate, accurate measurements of time uh, humanly possible. Because, yep. like, what is it, 9 billion times a second, a certain yep. um, atom cesium. jumps. Yes, cesium. Yeah. It jumps from an outer orbit to an inner orbit, or, or vice versa. Yes. I can't remember which. Yeah, the electrons themselves will jump between orbits. So it'll go up in an orbit and then back down. On a regularly very, um, measurable... 9 billion times a second. Okay. On a regular... Uh, time period and every time it jumps back down it emits a little flash so you just watch you know these uh, a cesium atom mm -hmm. and you watch that flash and then you have a counter that counts that and every nine billion that's a second so if you're counting those nine billion times per second doesn't that mean yep. but the days aren't exact doesn't that mean eventually the atomic clocks are going to get off and it'll be noon at midnight I mean, it would take <laughs> an infinite amount of time to get there. but infinite amount of time. Well, I was just <laughs> counting the passage of seconds. Oh, okay. you can, that's just, you know, one second has passed, two seconds have passed. Mm -hmm. You know, eventually, if uh, 901 in one second has to be 901 in zero seconds. Oh, they can just reset it. They can just recalibrate yeah, the clock. Yeah, you can just, you know, recalibrate the clock if need be. Of course, just like I'm overthinking years this. Or, you know, every year is actually 365.25. We just add that day every four years. To recalibrate. Yeah, to recalibrate. Right. Okay, well, you know what? All this is fascinating, and the fact yep. that we can measure something that ticks 9 billion times a second is actually pretty darn yeah. mind-blowing. But when you get down to it, these are all just measurements of the effect of time. Yep. They're yep. not actually measuring the... I can't even fathom the concept <laughs> to put it into words, but the force, I guess you might call it, of time? Yeah. Like the actual, the thing that time does that makes things happen. <laughs> <laughs> the thing and that pushes us forward. Right. Now that's the part of time, time that I find really fascinating because even though we yeah. can't actually you know, quantify that directly in some ways, we do have ways to like, well, there's uh you pointed the term out Planck time to me. Yes. Which is basically, uh, uh, well, maybe you should explain this because I'm, I was trying to wrap my brain around it earlier and apparently <laughs> I got some parts wrong. So tell me about Planck time. Planck time is just, it's, we get the small, the smallest distance that our current theories can handle. Mm -hmm. And we say, okay, we know how fast the speed of light is. It is a constant, you know, wherever you are, however you look at it. So how long does it take us, the speed of light to travel the shortest distance we can measure? That, that, is the, that is the Planck 
that is a Planck time. And then that becomes the smallest unit of time time measurable. So in a way, actually, that means that we can make it, if we get down to the very tiny scales, we can make time and distance almost almost interchangeable Yeah. within a, an equation? Yeah, it's something that can tie it all together. You know, you can sort of translate through. Like the smallest common denominator of anything. Yeah. Okay, well, that's handy. But it still is just a measurement. And in fact, yeah. by the definition that we had, uh, that you wrote in our, our, in our show notes, uh, it mm-hmm. actually sounds more like a unit of measuring space rather than time and i realize it's kind of interchangeable but yeah whatever okay that one is folding my brain a little too deeply (laughs) (laughs) now uh you you mentioned earlier you you just mentioned when you were talking about space time and uh that the speed of light is constant yes but it's not always constant right i mean technically it still travels at the speed of light but the speed of light changes under heavy gravitational fields. Yes. I mean, um, that it does. there's another experiment that uh, a man by the name of Shapiro was doing, uh-huh. uh, where he measured he was measuring the uh, the orbit of I'm sorry, was it Mercury or Venus? Yes, it was Mercury. It was Mercury, and every yep. time the planet would pass to the opposite side of the sun from where the Earth was, it looked like that its orbit went whoop way yeah. out away from us. Now the yeah, reason he was for that, out a signal, like you know, a radio bou- signal, like a radio signal bouncing it off the planet. You know, mm-hmm. to measure how far away it was. Except when it got really close to the sun, suddenly it took longer. Mm-hmm. So it's like, did Mercury just jump away from us and zoom back? Well, no, that would be silly. Why yeah. would you even say that? Exactly. <laughs> so, but the reason for that was because the speed of light at which that radio transmission was traveling, when yes. it got too close to the sun, it mm-hmm. slowed down because yes. of the intense gravitational field of the sun. Yeah. So... Gravity has an effect on time. Yep. Um, what? <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, this goes back to actually the whole reason that we started talking about this. Last week we were talking about space time. Yeah. And there is a certain, well, there's a, I, I'm not sure if this is solid or this is just a, a theory, but mm-hmm. uh, you were telling me that there's an interchange where when you get start going very near the speed of light, time slows down it's like an energy exchange of some sort can you maybe maybe i didn't explain that very well can you make it a little clearer for the people that actually have brains left at this point <laughs> <laughs> for everyone whose brain has not been mushified yeah there's that's why i'm wearing headphones it's to keep the brains in to keep the brains from spilling out <laughs> yeah oh, okay. well that's, that's very kind of you. yeah um it's this theory where you kind of get an exchange like you have so much energy and you can either use it traveling through time or traveling at the speed of light and so if you get closer to the speed of light, then you're using up some of that space-time energy, and so you start slowing down time. And this is all a part of Einstein's um, relativity, correct? Yeah, this kind of goes back um, to that. Okay, so, so, so uh, uh, slow down just one minute. Um, if okay. time is relative, uh, uh-huh. that means that it can pass at different um, times for different people <laughs> based on their different speeds and, and observe and points in space and stuff like that right yes that is correct so doesn't that mean that theoretically two different people could witness the future at different points at, and if that's true doesn't that mean that the future in front of us is actually fixed to a certain point as basically to an observable point to some degree uh, there's new theories coming out where it's you know it's the difference between does all time exist at all points Mm -hmm. or is time sort of uh, creating like a map discovery in a game where it's just sort of coming together in front of you as you travel. It's the fog of time. The fog of of time. Sort of comes together as you go through it. That I still don't get it because, okay, (laughs) let me just uh, paint you a theory. Let's say you travel away from earth at the speed of light, you know, Uh Because we can do that, right? And then of you course. come back at the speed yep. of light. Now, for yep. the person that travels that distance, uh, is it a lot of time has passed or almost no, no time has passed? It's almost no time. This is what they call the, commonly called known as the twin paradox. This right. This is where you have a set of twins. One, one stays on Earth, one hops on his spaceship, travels five years, turns around, decides he's homesick or he's done with his mission, comes back. Now, he's just maybe, you know... You know, five, you know, five years older or whatever, however long his, you know, mm-hmm. it took for him to go back. And his twin is like 80. Back on Earth that didn't move. Yeah. 
Yeah, or, the one that you know, did, that orbited the, the, the sun one that stayed or on Earth and just orbited the sun. Yeah. Got older by decades. Doesn't that mean that the person on Earth is technically in the future? I mean, technically? Sort of. Technically, <laughs> when you look up in the sky, you're just seeing the past. Oh, okay. I, I was holding on for a minute there, but you just melted my brain completely. <laughs> so uh, I think we maybe just need to, <laughs> to end this episode, quit while we're ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Now, we, we plan to talk to you guys all about like time travel and the theories behind it and everything, but I, I don't know if I've got enough left in me. I'll be honest. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that in the next episode, we're going to be getting down to a little more solid science and talk a little bit more about um, technology that might be being used to, to actually measure the effects and the secrets of the universe, because all this theoretical crap is just, wow. <laughs> I tell you. All right. Well, join us again next week for SciBite. We'll, I'll have Heather back with me here, and we will take you through the yes. mysteries of the universe one more time. Yep. Bring an aspirin. 